I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's episode of the Creative Mindset Podcast, where I interviewed Ryan Hayashi, a modern day practitioner of the Samurai Way. He's a martial artist, a magician, a professional speaker, and a lecturer at the University of Mannheim in Germany. You're going to love this episode. It's full of philosophy. It's full of ideas and perspectives that you have not heard before. He is a modern day Mr. Miyagi. You're going to love this. It's a far ranging, far reaching conversation. And I found him fascinating, lovely, incredible, powerful, and incredibly wise. Hello, Ryan, and welcome to the show. Before we get into this, I'm going to introduce you. We're going to sort of do a double introduction. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. And uh, what's going to happen is, just so you know, we are going live, as in this is minimally edited. Not live right now, but when it goes up, I want everybody listening to get the flavor of you as you are. So I'm not going to go through, and if we happen to um, or if I have a cat who periodically likes to jump in my lap from about 15 feet away. We, we call him Ninja for a reason. Actually, he yeah, should... The cat is named Ninja. Yes, yes. He in is our, our short uh, online chats, you, you're a martial artist as well. I am. Yes, I'm a Shodan in, in Aikido. A Shodan, for the viewers not familiar with that, a first degree black belt in the traditional Japanese martial art of Aikido. Yes, Tomiki style, if that helps. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> very awesome. Very awesome. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm very excited. I can't wait to talk martial arts with you. That's fabulous. So uh, let how me do... Japanese was that? I just, I just I realized without doing an after <laughs> I did it that I, I was bowing to you like this and through the computer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really funny because my senseis, but what I, I have, I, I'm taught by sort of a team. One is a physicist and one is an engineer. So it's Aikido with, uh, from a really scientific perspective. And I went to second degree green in, in karate, karate back when I was a child in, in Ishinru. And it was really strange to go from a very hard style to a very soft style, but it's all science and physics based. So when they talk, they go, okay, so imagine a two body system, like a binary star. So that. <laughs> So when we get our examples, we often are looking at things like the cosmos instead of things that might be a little bit more Japanese in nature. So it's a different way of learning, I will say. Binary star. Yeah. Aikido. Who <laughs> is interacting like a binary star? Exactly. I love it. I'm doing my Mr. Miyagi voice there. So <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Oh, oh I think I think that's I think that's great. My listeners will love them. I, I'm a I'm a ginormous karate kid dork, so I will Have you been watching Cobra, uh, Cobra Kai? Kai? No, I haven't. I've had no ah. time. I really want to. It sounds amazing. It's amazing. Season one, killer. I'm now watching season two. Just absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to watch it. I, I'm in the middle of literally right now. We just went and found an apartment. We're moving to New York in June. So life is going to oh, be. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's going to be great fun. But it means uh, downsizing 25 years worth of stuff in this house for a very small little apartment. So that's what I'm doing right now with my, with my time when I'm not doing uh, speaking engagements. I'm trying to downsize 25 years worth of stuff into 700 square foot apartment in Bushwick. So <laughs> it's going okay. to be different. Yeah. So now that we've sort of chatted for a little bit, let me do the official formal Ryan Hayashi introduction. And I would love to get, uh, get a lot of the questions. I actually did a little, uh, sort of informal poll and got the questions from people who listen to the show about some of the things they want to know about you. So if you don't mind, I'd love to do that and then ask you those questions and let's chat. Go for it. Okay. So let me start by saying that Ryan Hayashi is a modern day samurai. He was born in Canada and now lives in Mannheim, Germany, where he lectures at the University of Mannheim. He began the study of martial arts at the age of nine and is a martial arts sensei or teacher today. He also spent time living and training in Tokyo, Japan. He studied at the World Headquarters School of the Japan Karate Association. He, he is a medal-winning competitor in martial arts and in 2011 received an astounding 9.9 .9 at the Martial Arts World Championship, which is incredible. For those of you who don't follow martial arts, they don't hand those out. <laughs> so that's an amazing achievement. 
When Ryan isn't teaching his martial arts students or appearing live on TV and showcasing his incredible skills, he travels the world and performs. He appeared on Fool Us with Penn and Teller, and he fooled them with martial arts and magic and mystery. It was a, I, I recently rewatched the video, and it blew me away yet again. He recently visited the USA and appeared at a number of conferences and events, including the Habitude Warrior Conferences in San Diego and Dallas and at the Magic Castle in L.A. The combination, I'm going to talk a lot more to Ryan about this, the combination of martial arts and magic is a match made in heaven as far as I'm concerned, so I'm super excited to learn about that. I'm thrilled to welcome Ryan to the Creative Mindset Podcast and to learn more about his samurai practice, concentration strategies, and how he combines art, science, history, magic, and the martial arts in his work and his life. Ryan, welcome. Officially, I'm super excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me on, Isolde. This is so great. So talk to me about being a samurai and a martial artist, as well as being a performer and educator. Before we get into the nitty gritty of all that, though, can you explain what a samurai is? Yes, legally, the samurai, as they existed in former times in Japan, have uh, been disbanded, like the knights of ancient Europe. Uh, they used to be a specific class of people you had to be born into with uh, other rights and other legal uh, status than the regular citizen. Uh, what we now practice in Budo, or the, the modern world's practices of the Japanese samurai cultural heritage and traditional arts um, keep much of that alive, but uh, we no longer have um, legally recognized samurai warrior as they were before 1868, uh, before the reformation of laws that um, didn't make it illegal to train the martial arts, but uh, disbanded Japan's version of the nobility and the, the, the knightly orders, which uh, literally gave them the right to behead or, or slay anyone in the street who they felt uh, uh, wasn't being polite to them. Uh, Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But, yeah, but we in the times we live in, uh, to follow the samurai way is is kept alive in, in many arts: aikido, iaido, kendo, uh, kyudo, karate do, uh, what we collectively call budo or or the martial way. And so you, it sounds to me like you're keeping the the ideas and the practices and the energy alive of that, rather than the official titles of it. Is that is that a fair assessment? That is a fair assessment. It, it, it represents a, a moral code, a mindset, a military tradition, and, and a way of life. So that last one, way of life, how do you incorporate the samurai traditions and practices into your life? I am, um, <laughs> for some of your viewers, I, I'll have to sort of preface this in a, in a special way. I am semi-immortal. Uh, not entirely. I, I'm sure I will uh, pass on at some point, but I don't age like the average human. Uh, my dad, who was born in 1934, who remembers the carnage of the Second World War, is now 84 years old and st still goes to work every day at his own business because he wants to. His father, my direct grandfather, was born in 1887. So I come from a very long line of uh, uh, human beings who, who age in, a, in an incredible way. Um, I also had an upbringing which you will rarely find in a living human being in today's world who's younger than 70 or 80. I can, uh, and I mean this in the most loving and respectful way, I grew up in, in a very linear, very strict, very old school fashion uh, relationship with my dad. I've never once hesitated, never once talked back whenever told to do something by my father. And, uh, um, you, you know, that, that's, that's very rare to find these days. So I, I do tick differently because I was brought up differently. And my entire life is patterned after that. So it's more than me just walking into my martial arts studio, putting on a training uniform and, and leading, a, leading a training. Uh, those who know me better do know that the way I react to situations, the way I go after goals, the way I speak to people is dictated by 
a style of behavior that is has largely gone ex extinct. So I, I have been transported forwards in, in, in time from a very old culture. And in this culture, where you live now in Germany, it sounds like it sets you apart some, or have you found a community of people where there are others who go, oh yeah, I recognize this in you, because it must make you a really great sensei if people can sort of recognize a different way of living and learn more about that. Um, well, as, as you know, as, as an Aikido ka or an Aikido practitioner, uh, karate is, is very mainstream. You can find it all over the world. Uh, because of our particular style, Nihon Karate Kyokai, which is uh, the Japan Karate Association branch of traditional karate. Uh, most of my closer friends and, and colleagues from the karate instructors here in Germany, well, worldwide where I'm based, uh, tend to be Japanese or tend to speak extremely fluent Japanese and have, have been to Japan several times. And uh, they sometimes make jokes as well about me coming from, a, from another era, but I can understand it. <laughs> I understand. I, I'm an immigrant and was born in the former Soviet Union and came oh, over to yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that so so when 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 my husband and I chat, we he often calls me an alien. He does not say from a different era, he just says He's from a older different than, planet. <laughs> He's older than, uh, he sounds so American. <laughs> yes, I, I do. I came when I was pretty young, but but yeah, it's that that I think that trans that translation of or transformation, I would say, from someone who's born in a different country and now lives somewhere else, it does make you have to grow up differently. And it sounds like your family definitely did that too for you, is giving you that. May that. I ask what year you left the Soviet Union? Was it before or after its collapse in 1990? Before, 1974. Oh, okay. So you, you literally left the Soviet Union. Yes, we we immigrated to, move to, to the what was at that time the the hated capitalist West. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> uh, how old were you when you left uh, the Soviet Union? Six. Did you speak Russian? Da, of course. Speak Russian. Привет, всё хорошо. Я немного говорю по русски, потому что у меня есть много русских друзей. Oh, well, говорите очень хорошо по-русски. For those of you who are interested in what we're saying, we're going, oh, my stars, you speak Russian, I speak Russian. And, <laughs> and telling each other that we speak Russian pretty well. I have a, a very uh, a funny little story. I was in Ukraine doing a training, and my, they gave me a translator, an interpreter, and a helper. And Fyodor, who was from St. Petersburg, he and I are walking down the street in Kiev after dinner one night, and he didn't know that I was born in the former Soviet Union. And he said to me, this is all in Russian, and he said, oh, I just wanted to tell you, you speak Russian so well. And I said, well, I was born in Moldova. And he goes, oh, then you speak Russian terribly. So... <laughs> So, because of the sort of cultural and historical context, yeah. Well, I no, because I speak Russian like I'm six years old, right? Because oh, I see. Okay, you know, uh, my I I have a I have no discernible Russian accent when I speak English, but a pretty discernible other accent when I speak Russian, and when especially you speak Russian. You sound like an American tourist trying to to speak Russian. Actually, no, I I sound a little better than that, but uh, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but this is not a, a talk about me. This is a talk about you. So let me, let me bring us back to the martial arts. Sure. What drew you to studying the martial arts? I mean, you started when you were young, what, six years old, something like that. What's, what drew you, what made you go, this is what I want to do. I started training in the martial arts, martial arts in 1982 when I was nine. Okay. Um, uh, Never consistently, never seriously. I, I began training seriously at the age of 19 when I uh, came into first contact. Well, not only contact, when I first came under the tutelage of my first Japanese uh, sensei as a university student in Ottawa, Canada. And uh, I, it just, I enjoyed it, you know, never wanted to make a living from it because I obviously, uh, growing up in 80s North America, knew, uh, you know, not a lot of money in, in opening up a martial arts school or being a martial arts instructor. And that became clear to me, you know, in my twenties as well. But I just, I like the effect it had on me. So stuck with it. 
Oh, that's wonderful. And I imagine, you know, we were talking about Karate Kid. That probably helped a lot of people become more interested in the martial arts. Karate Kid, and before that, what interested me was Kung Fu, the, the TV show with David Carradine. That made me... Kwai Chang Kang. <laughs> yes, Kwai Chang Kang was my, one I of my heroes. I help you. Yeah. I am soft-spoken. I hit no one. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Yeah, loved loved him. So let's talk about that idea of of well, violence, nonviolence, but also your just generally your your work must require a lot of discipline. And do you have a practice to maintain your discipline, or is it just an outcropping of how you were raised? No, that's just how I am. I roll out of bed, and I'm just I'm me all the time. Yeah. So you don't have any, do you have a, a meditation practice or anything like that? Or is it just daily <laughs> everybody, meditation? Everybody asks me that if, if I just, if I'm just regular guy, you know, drinking Coke and eating cheeseburgers one minute, you know, put on my, my ninja outfit, you know, meditate in front of candles and suddenly wake up the guy that they, they see on camera. No, I, I, I like this all the time. Outside of your podcast, if you call me the, the same way of speaking, the same the views. <laughs> it's just, it's highly ingrained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you practice quiet mind all the time or is it just this, this is who you are and that's how it goes? Um, I learned very early on that um, I'm better in that, in that mind frame. So mm -hmm. other than a couple of drinks as a, as a, 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 you know, college kid in university, I don't drink alcohol. Um, I avoid too much sugar if I can. Um, it's interesting, you're leading into the mushin or, or the empty mind, what, what scientists call um, uh, temporal hypofrontality. And for your viewers, what that is, anyone who's doing something they want to do and enjoy doing. So not under stress, not, not for their survival, but the sort of animal instinct where higher functions like future planning, abstract dreaming, and complex uh, problem solving when that shuts down and you just get tunnel visioned and focus on one thing to make it happen but not because you have to because you're having fun it's your sport you're snowboarding you're you're building something you like and you want it to look great you're playing a game you want to win uh it's what in english most people commonly call being in the flow or in the zone you're liking it you enjoy it you're doing something you want to do but you're you're as present and as focused on it as, as you can be and this positive uh, heightened level of uh, concentration and focus is uh, is essentially what in Japanese we call mushin or, or the the clear mind or empty mind um, and I just learned very early on to tap into that every human does if they get a chance to work on something they like and I've just learned uh, that if, if you can actively cultivate that put yourself into that mindset often enough. And when you need it, then you just sort of think better, function better and make more stuff happen. There's, there's no magic to it. Yeah. Oh, I, I, there is a magic to it. I think it's just a different kind of magic personally, because to me, what you're talking about is that that's the creative mindset. When you are in that space, you, you are only in that space and there's nothing yeah. else. So that's, I love it. When I talk to my students about that, we talk about how you'll lose time. Time doesn't seem to matter because you are in that place of, in my, from my perspective of creation, whether you're writing or drawing or painting or doing martial arts, whatever it is, if you're in that moment, that's, that's the creative mindset. So it's very, it's very similar. And I like knowing the Japanese, uh, name for it. I think that's great. Mushin, you said? Yes. Mu, mu it means without. Mm -hmm. So a martial arts practitioner who has a white to brown belt, uh, we generally refer to as mu dan shin. Mu without dan is a black belt uh, uh, grade ranking. And uh, sha, mu dan sha, sha is a person. Mm hmm so someone uh, without the without the first don, without the black belt ranking. Without, without a black belt or a first don or higher. Mm -hmm. So somebody uh, as yourself who has attained a first degree black belt or higher in a, a classical martial art, we call you dan sha. You is with. Mm -hmm. A person with a, a don a ranking. Yeah. So the mu just means emptiness. Mm -hmm. The shin meaning meaning the mind. So an empty mind. Mu shin. I love it. And it's it's funny that you said that uh, 
you know, that, that, that first don, that first degree black belt to my sensei, basically it means that now I've finally achieved the right to start learning. And that's where I am. Yes. <laughs> yes. Serious yeah. beginner, advanced yeah. beginner, who's now going to uh, hopefully stick around long enough to, to learn something. Exactly. That's, and that's what it is. When I got my, when I got my black belt, that's what they said. You are now officially cleared to begin to learn. Thank you. It only took four years. All right. So let me ask you, these ideas, where do they come from for you? Where do you get them? Um, ideas for my act. I'll, I'll, I'll give, I think, my favorite example. Uh, within, within the magic world, actually, what you recently saw aired uh, on July the 9th, 2018, my spot on Penn and Teller Fool Us, my first time on American television and one of the happiest, emotional, most, most emotional moments of my life, performing in front of two of my uh, uh, childhood idols. Um, what you saw there was what I would call sort of a um, here you go, impromptu on the spot presentation. I, I was wearing a, a shirt and a vest, I was being the funny guy, and my presentation didn't really go beyond, hey, look people, I've got four cards, four coins. I threw in a couple of, nerdy Star Wars references. I threw in this epic monologue about no matter how good you are, how hard you work, there will always be an Asian who takes it to the next level. Uh, with the motivational, the real motivational message behind it tied right in the middle of it, which people sort of could smell and felt that I, I meant for real that uh, um, I, I'm, I'm living my dream right now speaking to all of you. So for everyone watching, if you have a dream, Never give up believing in your dream, living in your living your dream and doing something every day to make that dream happen. But within the magic world, because we do have uh, magic competitions, just like everything else in the world, you have uh, uh, like dance crew and, and ballet and whatnot, you know, tennis competitions. There are competitions in the magic industry, which uh, muggles, which the regular world never gets to hear about at the regional, national, continental, European, and, and of course, uh, world level, held every three years. And my competition version of, of that coin act with the four coins under the four cards has a beautiful story. And I'll tell you how the story came about and you'll sort of see my creative process. Um, I developed exactly what you saw on that TV show, Penn and Teller Fool Us in 2004. Two years later in 2006, I entered, uh, the World Championships of Magic held in Stockholm, Sweden. My epic monologue wasn't there yet. It wasn't that witty. It was more or less just me showing off, hey guys, look at this. And you know, great set of hands, coins vanishing and, and moving around. Um, and uh, it ranked in the top 10 for, for the world for that industry. And then I let it rest for another several years until 2016. What is that? And yeah, I waited a decade on it. So I just let it rest for a decade. I'd, I'd been performing it at larger events. It had a video camera. It could blow up my hands on screen. And then I was speaking to my brother who comes from, uh, who works in television production, who has uh, lectured at the university level on screenwriting. And uh, by 2016, let's see, I was, I was born in 73 at, uh, how old was I? 2016. It's three years ago. 43? Yeah, at age 43, I asked my brother, um, I have this beautiful piece of magic. It's visual, physical magic, but how, if I were to enter one last time, and just because I love competition, I just, for me, winning stuff is fun. It just, um, I asked him, what story could I write around this to, to make it an even more powerful piece of theater? Um, and, and then he just laid it on me. me. Me and my brother, he's only a year younger. We're almost like twins. And he told it to me straight. He said, well, at the moment, you're nothing more than a juggler presenting a puzzle. You're laying down some cards and coins on, on a table. You're doing sneaky moves. Nobody can see how they vanish and reappear somewhere else. That's it. If, if you wanted to tell a real story, write a script for television or film, you have to follow four basic rules. The first being it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an, and an end which I didn't have at the time. The beginning tells the people what's coming up, what's gonna happen. The middle, something happens, and a good ending, not like the more modern or recent uh, music videos where they just fade to black, a good ending is like Michael Jackson end of Thriller turning to the camera with his cat's eyes. You know you've just seen and, and 
felt the ending before the credits roll. Okay, so that made sense to me. The second rule, he said, the protagonist in any good story, E.T., Titanic, Harry Potter, wants to have or be or achieve or do something, but there are problems in his way. E.T. wanted to go home, had no radio to call home. His, sh his ship was destroyed. Titanic, um, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio wants the redhead snobby rich girl, and you know he just doesn't have the cash to exist within her sphere of influence. Um, Harry Potter, he's got you know the Lord of Darkness, who shall not be named, on all those Death Eaters who want him dead because of whatever reason. So you get what I mean. Sure. You have to get over hurdles. The third uh, rule was that um, <laughs> there should be some change of heart or change of mind in that protagonist from beginning to end. So at the beginning of E.T., E.T.'s afraid of humans because he doesn't know if we're uh, friendly or, or not. By the end, he makes friends and they send him home. Uh, beginning of Titanic, a snobby redhead Rose doesn't talk to second-class passengers who are poorly dressed. By the end, she's hanging on to Leonardo DiCaprio in the ice water for dear life and wants to save her. And then the fourth one, and my brother said, if, if you can get this down, you're going to have a real piece of art happen. <laughs> he said... Tell a deeper story that the adults will have to think about that the six the six year old might not catch on. So the six year old watches Harry Potter, you ask him what was the story about, he'll say Harry goes to magic school, learns magic. True, but it's actually about the Death Eaters being against uh, the defiling of the pure wizard bloodlines. They don't want mud bloods or humans involved. And they, they want to maintain the purity of their race. That's what the whole story is about. Um, you, you look at E.T., you ask the six-year-old what, what happened. E.T. wanted to go home, he called home. He did, but it's actually xenophobia. It's his fear of uh, foreign cultures that, that he, he doesn't know, and, and so on and so on. So there, there's always a deeper story. So if you can get that deeper story happening, bam, you're done. So I took, I took uh, half a year, called him back, told him I had a storyline, which was I play myself. A karate sensei, a martial arts instructor, is sitting in his studio. All of the story is true, by the way. It's based on uh, real life. I have a, a boy, and I used his real name as well, and his real voice in the recordings. His name's Johnny, and he approaches me one day and says, uh, Sensei, I've seen in YouTube you have this, all this magic stuff you do with the coins. I'd really like to learn that. Can you teach it to me? And I brush him off and say, no, Johnny, I don't do that anymore. I haven't trained since I uh, quit magic because that was the age at which I, I retired in 2012 and just focused on opening my own dojo. <clears throat> he leaves the room. Of course, the, uh, the movie violin music starts in. I watch him. He's invisible, but you can hear and feel him there. I watch him walk out the door. Door closes. Just that little glimmer right there of, hang on, what, what did I just do? You know, I sit down at my desk. And I work with a theatrical director here because as you know, my act takes place on a desk, but I thought, what does this desk represent? It just had, you know, a nice day plan or a calendar with a pen sitting on top of it, done. Brilliantly, that explains what it is. I move a couple of magazines aside, on top of that, an old box I haven't touched in years. Now, at first, the, the first concept was to put baby powder on it and blow away a cloud of dust, but even that got cut down to me just looking at the box, doing this and bam, within one second is communicated. Whatever's in that little box you haven't seen, he hasn't seen in years. I open it up and bring out these four cards and four coins. One more look in the direction of where the door was to make sure I'm alone, then I play with them. And as I play with them at first, I can't even do the trick right. And then somehow the coins move on their own and I don't know what happened. I didn't make the magic happen. I'm the observer and I'm surprised by what, what I just, I didn't put them there. And then I, okay, hang on. I want to see that again. And it happens again. Then I make it happen. And then I, I you can see my face. Like, oh, whoa, 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 hang on. That was magic. And then I'm enjoying it. I'm getting back into it. And right at the end, when I make the magic happen with that sort of feel and vibe I had for the whole Penn and Teller segment where I'm the man, look at me, magic, magic. magic I just have that happen at the last second. get quiet, pick them up, put them back in that little box, the door opens and the, the, my students walk back in again and I say, Johnny, why do you want to learn magic? Uh, and he has the cutest voice. When I, see, when I see it, 
I, I get the feeling that everything is possible and I want to make the magic happen. And I say, okay, Johnny, let's make it happen. And then I, I just materialize, I, I pluck a coin out of the air, which you know is reminiscent of pulling a coin from behind a child's ear. And he freaks out, he goes, does, does that mean you're gonna teach me magic? Yes, Johnny, I'll teach you, but you're gonna have to train a lot. And he goes, yes, yay, I promise I'll train hard, promise I will. I say, I know you will, Johnny, I know you will. And then, and then he walks off and being the genius my brother is, he said, you got your script right there, just do two things. Don't have a handful of cards and coins. Have everything in a little box. It's just neater. Even if the kid's not there because you don't want to hire some little actor, just get down on one knee when you question him and have the box in front of you and the audience will understand you're symbolically handing over your life's experience, your life's work, because now it belongs to him. So uh, you're, that's my long answer to your question. How do I come up with stuff? I just keep asking questions. I just keep dreaming up uh, different scenarios and uh, put pieces together. So I, I tend to be just a highly structured uh, putter together of pieces that I think up and, and see or get from smart people. <laughs> your brother sounds like a genius. I love it. Well, so within that, when you're when you're solving these problems or asking these questions, what do you do when it feels right versus when it doesn't? Do you immediately let go of something that's like, no, that's not quite the right answer. That's not quite what I wanted. Or do you have somewhere where you keep those kinds of ideas that might have potential but won't fit with the particular thing you're doing right now? Oh, there are no bad ideas. I just caught, I catalog them all. Mm -hmm. I'll keep written or video records and, 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 come back to them. Uh, sometimes I've made the mistake in putting together a uh, show acts, magic acts where <laughs> I just went too far on bad ideas <laughs> in 2000, because I do speak uh, uh, several of the world's major languages. And in, in 2012, uh, when I competed again at the world championships, my second time, um, I wrapped my act wrapped um, <laughs> um, in 10 different languages thinking to myself, oh, it's an international crowd and it, it tells like everything I'm saying to you. It tells my life story, who I am, what I'm doing. But then I, you know, didn't look at the obvious and realize, well, you know, it's an international panel of judges, each of which will understand a little bit, like 10%. And they're not, during my 10 minute segment, gonna take the time to compare notes and say, say hang on, what did he say in those other nine languages? So it was a big ego trip. It felt really awesome. I invested three years of like studio and audio cutting time to generate the soundtrack. And at the end, it was a really crappy presentation that nobody liked because nobody could understand it. Yeah, and you have to know your audience then and research it. Yeah. So you mentioned something that I, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how all of this has transpired. So let me see if I can get the timeline right. You said yeah. in 2012, you retired from doing magic and to, you wanted to open up your dojo, which you have done. Yeah. But you're doing magic. Did you come out of retirement? Is that what happened? Or I came out of retirement uh, to recompete at the 2018 World Championships with this Karate Kid uh, storyline with Johnny. I see. Okay. So what's the difference between the two, between martial arts and performing magic? What, what, are the, what are the things that you have to hang your hat on? Or are they similar somehow? Very different. Very different. Um, magic is, is all about... Um, gen <laughs> it's a very selfish thing. It's like stand-up comedy. You're performing. Mm -hmm. You're presenting yourself, you're presenting things you can do, you're presenting magical moments or magical happenings and 99% of the time presenting the idea that I somehow made that happen and none of you know how I did it because either I'm too clever or it's, it's, it's you didn't see it or I'm selling it as mystical or I'm selling it as my uh, abilities. The, the martial arts are, are a much more selfless uh, a pursuit it's it's more like stamp collecting where you just have to enjoy the process and decide <laughs> whether or not you want to want to continue with it because um the further you go in the martial arts in terms of experience time and rank the the more you just have to uh, be humble and accept the fact that um if you keep collecting stamps the collection will get bigger but uh it's not about you it's about the stamps and you'll never collect all the stamps so you'll never collect all the stamps <laughs> 
after you die, you can hand out the, the stamps to someone younger, the next generation. They could build on your collection or not. And you never know how long they want to keep collecting or quit or throw away your stamps or lose them or not take care of them, you know? So this, yeah, it's fundamentally different. Yeah. What are you learning now in, in, in your martial art as a sensei? Cause I just recently had lunch with my sensei. She's an eighth Don and, and she was telling me some of the cool new things they just figured out about, about the, the style that, that we study. And there was, there was a little bit of a, that's right. She's still a student, even though she's an eighth Don. So what are you learning? What, what's the most recent thing that's made you go <gasps> about your martial arts? Um, Again, again, it's re it's repeating this boy's name, but he he is a, a huge lesson for me in the martial arts. Little Johnny, who's not so little anymore. I'm I'm five foot nine. He's about five foot, at least ten or or eleven. Um, his mother brought him to me eight, four years ago at age eleven, and just wanted to enter her boy into some form of martial arts so he would learn some confidence and discipline. He was picked on at school. He was a mess. And uh, we've become very close. He's become like a son to me, although he's not officially or biologically my son. Um, my dojo team knows that. And now at age 15, he's become a copy of me. He's become very much a, a second me, which I think is great. And I, I will encourage him to maintain that the next maybe three years tops. And after that, at age 18, once this level of sort of self-confidence is ingrained in him at age 18 then he can do what he, whatever he wants then he can be a surfer boy he can be a, a hip hopper I, I don't care at that point but uh for now so what, what i'm learning from him is is the effect martial arts the, the real life the hands-on effect martial arts can have on the, the development of a person because for me it was just about having fun since johnny and, and several other students it's about uh, sharing a process with people it's, it's, it's turned Johnny from a very insecure, very messed up uh, little girl in four short years into a, into a fine young man. Interesting. Yeah. And what, what do you think sets a martial arts mindset apart from the mindset of the average person? Uh, well, there have been psychological studies that have actually uh, proven that the average uh, Dan ranked martial arts, the average black belt uh, does have higher social com competence, higher levels of self-confidence and the ability to resolve, uh, um, you know, problems and, and deal with stress. So it generates sort of calm, level-headed people who hopefully have less to prove. <laughs> That's important. So how do you think a, the average person might incorporate some of these principles, even if they, let's say they're not anywhere near a dojo or, or they can't afford one. What could somebody who wants to incorporate some of the principles do to start? Good question. Before I answer that, I just had a YouTube video enter my head, which I'll share with you. It, the title was something like what happens when an, I forget what the two styles were. It, it could have been a, a Wing Chun artist versus a Taekwondo or a Karate versus a Jiu. I can't remember. Uh, so what happens when a, an Aikido practitioner meets a, whatever it was, a kickboxer? And then it, it shows them like entering what, what looks like, a, there was a fence around it. It looked like a tennis court or some sort of an outdoor steel caged area. And of course, you know, this oh, you're there, antagonistic blick. They walk towards each other in each other's face. They're like, yo, bro, what's happening? They give each other a <laughs> um, Yeah, okay. Now, I'm going to allow myself to answer your last question. What can the average person do to try to incorporate um, some of this, some of the warrior mindset? Um, now, here's my answer. Your question comes at the right time in human history. The data shows, although we don't need we 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 don't need to to look at concrete data from scientists to see this. We can smell it and feel it around us. In the Western world, in North America, in Western Europe, um, young men, and at some point I, I heard the 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 typical age between what it was like between 18 and, and 32 or 34, something like that, have unprecedented rates of suicide, depression, self-hate, alcohol and drug abuse, 
Uh, they have dropping numbers of young men finishing high school. They have uh, uh, dropping numbers of, of men who, I'm not sure about entering university and beginning their university studies, but finishing their degrees. They have skyrocketing numbers of, of young men who are retreating from society. So lacking the, the, the drive to want to move out of mom and dad's home, stop playing video games, get a job, keep a job long term, get married and, and build something. So we, we have a whole group of, of young men who have just given up on themselves and given up on life. And, and now, if I say this with the wrong tone and with too much of a smile on my face, people will, will think the next statement is, is absurd and that I'm joking. There's a reason for this. I know what the reason is because I was brought up differently. What they are missing in their lives is Mr. Miyagi. I would say most of the mainstream media's depictions of a positive Real, male role model, positive father figure after 1990. Now, if we grew up in the 80s and we remember 80s movies and series, Luke Skywalker, when I was a eight or 10 year old kid, we all wanted to be Luke Skywalker because he showed the courage to stand up against evil and go through the process of investing to learn the skill set from a master Yoda to make, to make that happen. Or we wanted to be a Han Solo who would just you know, be a pilot, know how to fly the Millennium Falcon. We wanted to be Tom Selleck in Magnum PI because he had a huge mustache and, and, and <laughs> would just be ballsy enough to try to, you know, crack cases or the A team who wouldn't, wouldn't take payment and want to help the, the disadvantaged or the, the, the oppressed, you know, the warriors of justice. Um, if, if you're over 40 years of age, definitely over 45 and you can remember the Western world's, um, uh, 1980s culture or, or earlier, Bill Cosby, 30 years ago, Bill Cosby, Superman, and Luke Skywalker meant something. Now, you know, <laughs> it's all been torn down. Bill, Bill Cosby, okay, for obvious reasons. Uh, Superman no longer sells tickets because nobody cares about the character. That's from last reports, they fired the actor, Henry Cavill. Uh, Luke Skywalker, if you've seen uh, Star Wars Episode Eight, sorry to hear this, don't want to be political, but I was just one of the original um, mid-40s male fans who just couldn't handle that movie. It enraged me. The fact that the, the new uh, protagonist character, Ray, who magically is good at everything and doesn't have to earn anything, hands Luke Skywalker not a lightsaber, his own lightsaber, which he lost when his hand was cut off battling his father, which previously belonged to his father. This lightsaber represented more than just a mystical weapon that shot a beam out of it. It represented the last 30 years of what an entire generation of men aspired to do. The process of accepting and engaging in the process of self-development. A commitment to work. The time investment of finding a mentor or a sensei and learning from them, he takes it and for that short gag, throws it over his shoulder over a cliff, like a piece of garbage. And then the rest of his character was just written as the most useless, demasculated, don't want to be there, just sitting around wanting to drink himself to death, depressed case that it, it just, it, 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 you know, they're going to call me some fanboy who's overreacting, but it's only because Star Wars 30 years ago meant something to me and a lot of other men. Uh, so they, they've, you know, we used to have father figures who would give advice and have his family's interests at heart. Now, of course, I'm talking 60s, 70s, and 80s. No matter what you say about him today, Bill Cosby represented the perfect television father in the early 80s. You know, after 90, after even the late 80s, what did we have? We had Al Bundy, we had uh, Homer Simpson. We were only presented with bumbling idiots who never had anything smart to say to contribute to their families or their family's well-being. Same goes with mentor figures, Mr. Miyagi, Yoda, whoever. Same goes with, with positive male depiction. Um, and, and, you know, magically you only have to blink 20 years and then you have a, a whole generation of, of men who are struggling, you know, spiritually physically that's the other thing you can actually look at uh, their blood under a microscope and th they have the lowest level lowest ever recorded levels of testosterone now when you ask yourself so what testosterone is responsible for competitiveness 
concentration in men, getting stuff done. Um, you know, it, it, for anyone who's over 40, we think back to when we were kids. In order to see man boobs, in order to see, you know, pockets of fat on a man's chest, large enough that you see them pressing through a shirt, they had to be really fat men over 60. We now have man boobs on, on young college males who are 19 and 20 who should have, you know, a lot lower body fat. So this is, they're biochemically out of whack. They're, they're, there's something wrong. It's, it's the most awesome time in human history if you're born in the Western world and privileged enough to finish high school and choose a university. It's the greatest time ever to, to be a female. The world's at your feet. You can do and be whatever you want. Um, maybe, I hear from some women, not the best time in the world if you're between 20 and 40 and trying to find a, a high value male <laughs> because for some reason all i'm hearing is that all they find out there are dysfunctional guys who who lack drive who lack ambition who lack perseverance and and uh, don't know who they are anymore so uh, again that was a very long answer to a very good question what can they learn from the martial arts they can at least get pieces of of what used to be normal upbringing for humans that want to contribute to contribute to society male and female you know i am not saying the man always had to walk out with a briefcase and come home with honey i'm home and the, the woman had to stay home you know baking muffins in an apron but uh at, at least you know ambition and and you know the drive to work and achieve something used to be appreciated i'm hearing horror stories from north american parents now that you know Everybody on track and field day, even the last gets the same medal as the winners because just showing up is enough. It's not. What does that teach the kids? You know, the, the, the new lead character in Star Wars, episodes seven and eight, you know, she didn't have to, to struggle in the jungle doing a whole Rocky style training montage to, to get his hand cut off and get his ass kicked by, by the bad guy. She just magically, uh, says the Jedi mind trick words and the stormtrooper lets her go. She gets in the seat next to Han Solo, can magically fly the Millennium Falcon as well as he can, but he's been flying it for 40 years. The engine chokes up. She says, I'll be back, goes back, and she's top level engineer and can fix it like that better than Han Solo. She gets a lightsaber for the first time in her hands, squares off against Kylo Ren, the, the new Darth Vader cuts his face open because she doesn't need training. She just magically can win every situation, make the best decisions. And uh, I, I, I personally don't think that's the best message to teach uh, girls. Um, so uh, what, what can they learn? Um, responsibility. What can people learn from, depending on your instructor? Of course, we have dance, aerobics, martial arts, Tai Bo. Uh, of course, we have sort of freestyle, street fight, anything goes uh, uh, mixed martial arts, which doesn't have a lot of the cultural or philosophical background of the classical martial arts. But if we're talking about Budo, traditional Japanese martial arts, then uh, it's, it could be a first window for a lot of people to uh, this, this mode of thinking that has shaped human society, that you have to contribute something, you have to put in the time, put in the work to earn anything, to earn your rank to earn respect to earn your abilities to earn uh, anything you want to have so how do they start um well they don't necessarily have to sign up for uh, karate aikido or martial arts lessons although if they find a good instructor and i'm sure they could have fun doing that um there are several ways it just, just depends on what they want to be what they want to have or or or, or achieve um In general, it doesn't matter if they want to be a competitive gymnast or, or a, an architect. Uh, they just have to find the right mentors. They just have to put in the work. So, uh, I, and I get that, and I appreciate, by the way, the, the, you, you started talking about Star Wars, and I feel like we need to have another interview where we just talk Star Wars. Oh, Ryan, I <laughs> don't get me started. You'll never... You'll never shut me up. That'll turn into an eight-hour talk. <laughs> oh, abs uh, no, 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 absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, Star Wars was instrumental to me becoming, in many ways, who I am. Mm 
And it wasn't it wasn't Luke and Han. It was Leia because you know I'm female. Because but Leia uh, was a strong figure. Yeah, who picked up the blaster. Who who was leading Luke and Han just as much as they were leading her. Yeah, she held. She decisions. more than held her own. She yeah. definitely held her own. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that, yeah, and, and it's fascinating to me to hear this idea. I call them uh, teleparables or cineparables, those kinds of where you learn from the media in many ways because you might not have the lessons coming in a positive way from the people who, who are around you or who might be otherwise the ones you would look to for guidance and support. So when you're talking about mentors and mentoring and teaching, it's fascinating to me that you you also sound like you you took a lot of that from from some of those from some of those movies and television shows of of the seventies and eighties. But do you do the same thing when you teach? When you're when you're are you are you like with Johnny? Are you a mentor to your students in at the university or in your dojo? What is your role for them? Well, when we're in the dojo, uh, generally speaking, it, uh, what I'm teaching is 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 technique and kata on a hobby level because it's it's not contact fighting in our style uh just so that they they can enjoy it have fun learn some fitness and and learn a a new odd system of movements that uh the longer they stay with it the the more they get a piece of the martial way um when i'm teaching my university university courses it's it's my job to impart a certain impart to communicate a certain body of knowledge so I'm, I'm there to teach a certain amount of material. But if, if I get to know anyone in any context who um, gets to know me better and who I start to care about, if, if they have questions, I'll, I'll answer them. If my young Johnny, who's now 15, asks me how to talk to a girl he likes at school, then I'm, I'm happy to, to impart that because I'm older than him and I've been through it. <laughs> and him growing up with a single mom doesn't have access to that information otherwise. So it sounds like you are, you are filling that role. Yeah. That, that more mentor. Mr. Miyagi, you're Johnny's Mr. Miyagi. Uh, I like I'm that. Very much Johnny's real life Mr. Miyagi. I, I, I didn't plan this when I met this kid, but uh, when he first came to me, he was this pudgy little sort of victim, everyone hates me, everyone picks on me, smiley kid who had absolutely no focus. While the, the rest of the team was working on, on uh, drills and kata, he would just physically, literally wander over to the glass in like December and draw little hearts in, on the window, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah. That's changed. That's changed. <laughs> he sounds like a, a different, different person. <laughs> so tell me, when, when you made that switch in 2012, what inspired you to do that as opposed to staying someone who did professional magic? What made you go, uh, I'm going to open magic, the Yeah, I never did magic professionally. I, I've always oh, been okay. a lecturer, so I've always, uh, uh, for a living, been uh, doing the corporate language trainings. For, for, for companies who, who needed to better their skills in terms of negotiations and presentations and meetings um, and lectured at the university. Mm -hmm. So I'm, that, that's my main job. I'm a, a lecturer and have been the last 20 years at the University of Mannheim, which is one of the nation's leading schools for business and economics. It's uh, often referred to as the Harvard of Germany. Mm -hmm. And Germany is, is the, the strongest economy in the European Union. So that's, that's my Bruce Wayne day job. All of this other craziness, uh, performing as a magician or, or a television uh, ninja waving a samurai sword around were just to amuse myself and to to live out my 12-year-old wish to be a... Uh, I had three wishes when I was 12. I, I wanted to be a television ninja who didn't, after that whole 80s ninja movie craze, all starring the same guy, Sho Kosugi, and Bruce Lee and... David Carradine's Kwai Chang Kane. Um, I wanted to be a television magician, fascinated by what I saw from Doug Henning, David Copperfield, Lance Burton, Penn and Teller. Uh, and I wanted to establish a Guinness World Record at some point because I was fascinated as a kid by this, the, the yearly Guinness Book of World Records that uh, I was always reading at the library. And uh, took 30 years, but on the side and uh, still working a regular day job, not getting fired, I systematically made those things happen. 
what inspires you when you decide on a new challenge? What makes you go, I'm going to, I think your mindset is pretty much you're going to excel at it, but what criteria do you use when you're, when you're deciding on what to tackle next? In what to tackle next? I don't look at it that way. I just, I just tend to do stuff that, that, that I like. It's, it's super simplistic, but I've heard that question before. Do I, do I go to my mountain temple and meditate on what would be an epic project to take on? No, I just think uh, my current project is to, to do a two-man act competing alongside uh, young Johnny, who will be 15 at the qualifying eliminations uh, round. Uh, but next year in 2020, we'll be a 16-year-old still taller than me and still looking a year older uh, as, as a two-man act uh -huh. where we're more or less playing ourselves in sort of a father and son uh, uh, duo. Um, I just think about it. I, I see what's out there and I, I, I tell Johnny, you know what, this would be a lot of fun. I, I will be a drill sergeant. You're going, you're going to have to train this thing mercilessly like, 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 a, like a kata, like, like a martial arts drill. Um, and it's, it's going to have to reach a level of perfection you've never generated in your life, but I'll just, I'll show it to you. You just have to learn it, do your half of the act. And then, uh, at age 16, you'll, you'll win a major competition uh, on, on a major stage. And it's just going to make you a better person when you're 18 or 25. So I tell him straight. I also told him straight at age 13 that he only had two years to get himself up that hierarchy from victim to, to one of the leaders. Otherwise, he would finish school. He is, he's very bright. He'll get himself through university, but he'll always have that little uh, crying victim inside that's going to hold him back from a lot of opportunities in life. The women he wants to date are going to smell it. His, his, our, his um, work colleagues will smell it. His boss will smell it, and he'll just be passed up unless he can become a man or at least rise up in the hierarchy of, of the wolves that, that young boys are um, by the age of 15. And I gave him that task to, to make that happen in two years. And I did as much programming as I could to, to help him along the way, but he's in the right place now. That's great. What does that mean? You did programming. <clears throat> um, I, in those two years from age 13 to 15, I just talked to him like what he was just, just a, a young man, who hadn't developed the speaking abilities to have the other boys take him seriously. If they're pushing him around, he's talking to them or walking or looking or acting like a victim. So I just, uh, I did my best to, to teach through example and through some explanation as well, but words can only take so far when you're trying to teach something as big as confidence. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you teach somebody? You can teach somebody phrases, how, how, to, how to talk to someone or try to influence people or negotiate things your way. But uh, confidence, people are going to smell as soon as any person walks into a room. They don't know your name. They don't know who you are, but they can, they, they can see it in, in the way you're carrying yourself, the way you carry your body, your head, your eyes. And I just made him aware of that. And I told him uh, it, it's up to him to decide whether or not he develops that by age 15 or 18. Because if he's, he waits too long and is uh, later some 28 or 30, 30, 30 year old, you know, looking up some mentor, some other coach like me saying, teach me some uh, uh, confidence. Well, that, that's a bigger battle at that point. You think it's easier at, at his age right now? Is that what you're saying? No, it's more essential. <laughs> easier? Right. Yeah. Easier, I think, yeah, in some ways. I, I think once they're aware of what confidence is, this mysterious thing that's very hard to define, I, I think the average, if like there are all, always exceptions. We could take three 15-year-old boys and, and three 30-year-old men, and if they're messed up and lacking confidence, it, that's not a thing. We could look at three men from, from southern Italy and three men from Sweden. We don't know which country has more tall blondes and which country has more short, dark-haired guys. Look at a bigger sample. Look at 100 Swedish men, 100 Southern Italian men. And if you're an alien, you can still tell which country produces more tall blondes. Uh, so I think on average, yeah, sure. I think the average 15-year-old, if he's decided he likes what, it, what he sees when he looks at a confident person and wants to learn that skill set, um, 
Sure. I think the average 15 year old will have a faster time at learning breakdancing, skateboarding, uh, gymnastics, badminton, you know, beatboxing and confident body language, confident mastery of voice and, and speech than, than the average 30 year old. But 30 is still relatively pretty young. You can st still learn everything. So for any of the 30 year old viewers hearing this, don't give up on life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think, you know, elasticity and resilience, you can, you have more probably at 15 and a little less at 30, but you know, I'm not a youngster, but I'm still learning every day and I'm still developing everything, even at 52. The, the thing for me that's interesting though, is you said something that you then went on to sort of define, but you know, I'm going to have to ask you the question, what is confidence? What is confidence? Because mm -hmm. you said, oh, let's talk about confidence. It's really hard to define. And then you went on and you sort of touched on it a little. And now, That's of course. That's an awesome question. How, how do you explain what confidence is? It's like trying to, to, to define what love is, you know. <laughs> People describe it in different ways. Uh, I'm going to start opening my notes now. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. You know, I, I, I could just throw off a couple of ideas, but I, I you know. I have been trying to formulate those thoughts in, 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 into what, what confidence is um, because I've been trying to teach this to people. I've been, I've been trying to bottle it because I've, I've been told all my life, um, well, all my uh, adult life, you know, I was sort of a, a nerdy and quieter kid, sort of a fun to be around just, Hey, what's up teenager. But uh, all, all my adult life, I've, I've, uh, been told by other humans that I, I seem to have this off the charts confidence that really stands out as an Asian because most Asian guys don't have that. It's partially cultural, partially cultural, partially biochemical. That's very a interesting. Asian men have lower than average testosterone levels. Uh, you know, they, they, they tend to be shorter than a lot of white women with smaller hands and round baby faces and higher voices and the tendency not to get in your face and tell you what's going to happen because I'm going to make it happen. Their, you know, their temperament naturally, biologically speaking, and cultural programming just has them sort of sit back and not be the guy that takes over the team and and leads the battle like a conqueror. So I am, for those reasons, a unicorn. I am an anomaly. I know it. <laughs> Asian guy with thug appeal. All right, <laughs> one of the first few on the planet. All right. So because I've been trying to teach this to individuals, young 15 year old Johnny being one of them, how to, what is, what is confidence? Confidence is a, is a whole lot of stuff. It's, it's not just one skill set like, like uh, uh, riding a bicycle. It's a whole bunch of skills. One of them is posture and body language. And at a, you know, at a subliminal level, you know, even if you've rehearsed it a million times and you've got the coolest thing ever to say, uh, men and women will recognize you just have the coolest line ever that you've memorized how to say. The posture and body language is, is unmistakable. Mm -hmm. Some people can walk into a room and, and be ignored or, you know, men and women will look at them and say, okay, whatever. And others will walk in and they want to know what this guy has to say. They can, they can just sense intuitively, okay, hang on. I, I think we're in the presence of the man. Um, style. Now, this sounds obvious. Um, you know, they, they've, they've, they've done like really cool uh, scientific study experiments where they took three guys, all good looking, all the same height and shape, all the same age, dress one really down like he was living on the streets and having hard times. One guy, like a regular Joe guy, and one guy in the tailored Hugo Boss suit and sent all three of them off in a, a densely populated area of downtown New York or an airport, I can't remember, and had them beg for change. Well-dressed guy came out rich. <laughs> so, you know, study after study just shows that the way you look uh, mm -hmm. has a direct impact on the way people perceive you. Now, I feel like I'm stating the obvious, but so many people are asking me this. This is how I'm codifying it. Uh, voice and speaking skills. Mm -hmm. Again, studies after studies show that once you've mastered 
uh, voice and speaking skills, your, your effectiveness in making people care about you and listen to you um, just go up. Now, social skills, because I count that as something um, separate. Voice is training the ability to sound like this. Hi, Isolde, instead of um, like if the mic were off and I didn't really care, my natural tonality would be more like this. But, uh, you know, when I want the power behind it, then I get the, um, are you ready to rumble? No, Luke, <laughs> I am your father. And, you know, I just bring it down a bit, throw some sauce on it, and then I, I develop the ability to speak with a power voice. Um, and then the speaking skills is learning how to use words. The social skills is what a lot of people call this EQ, emotional intelligence. And uh, it's, it's just learning how to read and deal with people. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, that's magic. But, you know, it, it's a concrete thing. Decisiveness. Decisiveness is, is the ability to, to just make a decision, know what you want, communicate that clearly, and have everybody around you know what you're doing. Um, the ability to learn new things. Now, it's related, but for some reason, confident people just tend to be open-minded. They, they just tend to try things and they tend to, to listen. Um, and then uh, empathy. Empathy is the ability to make people like you, trust you, um, want to be around you, and, and, and care about what you have to say. Um, you know, confidence is, is highly tied in with charisma. Um, I don't know if there's a difference. You know, I could, probably, I could probably just look that up and see what the dictionary uh, uh, definition is. I probably won't agree with it, but, uh, you know, confidence is just feeling comfortable in your own skin, with your own abilities, your own experience, your own being. And I don't see it, any difference between that and charisma. Because every time I look at what people describe as charismatic people, uh, they're just displaying for me confidence. So I think they're closely related, if not one and the same. That's fascinating. It sounds to me like it's a combination of, for you, a combination of sort of external factors and internal factors that will together bring forth a more confident uh, sort of self-confidence, but also a, com a more confident demeanor as you move forward. And that is that something that you teach in your university classes? Do I teach confidence? <laughs> yes, because it sounds to me like you kind of do. When I teach, when I do my speaking, a lot of the work we do, I bring, I actually, it's funny how it's, it, the work we're doing is kind of along parallel paths because when I teach my workshops on public speaking and, and on negotiation, we talk a lot about confidence and about the need okay. to have it. And we actually do exercises and activities to help build it. So I'm curious to see if when you're teaching, when you're speaking, do you do the same thing? Uh, I think I touch on it a little bit indirectly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think so. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I, I'd love to see one of your lectures, see what that's like. So I'm going to change streams just a little bit okay. and ask you, I mean, and maybe the answer will be the exact same thing. You might just say a lack of confidence. If you were going to think about the greatest challenge that people face today, what do you think that is? Um. <gasps> A lack of confidence. <laughs> See, same answer. <laughs> I mean, how often do we, do we deal with people who talk about um, situations at work where uh, I, I just heard this like literally the other day, two days ago, I was speaking to one um, um, lady who, who told me there was a, a male colleague at work who actively went to the boss and said, yeah, well, you know, I've been around for, for, for this many years and I think it's about time I had a promotion. Now from, from a large number of people, I believe it was over a hundred, um, normally based on performance, just based on delivery. Um, I, I don't know if he really would have been a, a, um, the first choice for, for the promotion, but he was the one that ended up getting it. And then when this female person mentioned this to me, I said, good for him. He, he went for it and he got it. 
yeah, but this and that other colleague, you know, at, at least th there were a few of them which were female, had actually, you know, more successfully done this or that or performed better on this project. And I said, well, did they ask for it? Well, no. And I said, well, you know, case closed for me. <laughs> then there's your answer, right? Yeah. The boss decides who gets a promotion. One individual, you know, went to the boss and said, I, I should have it. He got it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, actually, uh, one of the individuals I really like to study is Madonna. Uh, not that your viewers think that I, I, I study and only care about like male achievers. Uh, Madonna is awesome for, for many reasons. And I, I think there will be more than one vocal coach out there who will say she's not necessarily the greatest voice in pop music. And they'll, they'll list uh, uh, an earlier, more, um, you know, Mariah Carey or a Celine Dion or, or a, a younger Whitney Houston whatnot as being great voices. And you, I'm showing my age now. I'm, I'm a little bit out of date, but they'll name not, other. Not voices. at all. Not at all out of date. <laughs> But that doesn't change the fact that Madonna is still the largest selling female music artist in, in all of history. She's also a tremendous marketer. She and there you a, go. And there a tremendous go. personality. I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I, Madonna, I know very well. Uh, not personally, of course. Although we, I grew up about one town over from where she grew up. So that's kind of fun. Oh. But, yeah, we, she's from Michigan. I'm from, I'm from, I grew up, when we immigrated, we moved to, to Detroit. And to me, her confidence is ultimately about her being willing and able to have these ideas and to bring them to fruition. And I've always respected her for that too, because she's out there and she's, she decides she's going to make a change or she decides she's going to do something and by gum, she does it. And she that. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, I watched a segment on um, which talk show was it? I don't know if it was Jimmy Fallon or, or I forget which it was, but she came on and great to have you Madonna and da, 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 and your latest children's book and your tour. And, uh, and, you know what, folks, Madonna has said she's always had the secret desire to do stand-up comedy. And she said, yeah. And then they gave her the full stage. She goes to the mic. She wasn't that great. But it was just the ballsiness of how she was delivering these jokes, which most of which were lame. And I was, I was cheering at my screen. I was like, go, girl, look at you owning it. She, she didn't care how good she was. She just wanted to be stand-up comedian in that moment and made it happen. <laughs> and 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 she was able to which i think is great yeah so let's talk about that idea of the people that you admire madonna you've yeah, mentioned a lot of people I admire. yeah can you can you talk about some of them who are some of the people who are your mentors who do you admire okay um mentors who i have not met personally but people who i admire because of what they've done um arnold schwarzenegger the governator because he, for me, is a perfect case study of serious attitude about what it is you want to achieve. The thing about Arnold Schwarzenegger is he says in his own interviews that he started bodybuilding at age 14, started lifting weights, uh, because he wanted to look like these American uh, bodybuilders he's, he's, he'd been looking at in magazines. We have internet photos of him at age 16. He was a beast. At age 18, he was winning all of the major European bodybuilding contests because it was the greatest physique Europe had ever seen or produced. Um, at age 20, when he told all of his friends in Austria, you know, broke, having not finished school, not speaking a word of English, that he was gonna to move to America, learn to speak English, go to business school, become a millionaire, become a Hollywood movie star, and become uh, the greatest bodybuilding champion of all time, they laughed at him until he made it happen. Mm -hmm. Early 80s, he marries one of the Kennedys. Anybody who saw that would have thought to themselves, well, if he ever wants to go into uh, politics later and become governor, bam, what does he do 25 years after that? He makes it happen. And he was a millionaire before doing the movies, just through real estate. He'd learned the basics of buying property, watching the market, did all of the construction and renovation work himself with his bare hands with a few other starving uh, wannabe bodybuilders. And then had people live in there, pay them rent, and then sell the properties at the right time. Um, Michael Jackson, regardless of what people now think after the recent Leaving Netherland uh, uh, documentary and controversy, when I look at his 
how he became the success story he was. Michael Jackson for me is the perfect case study of mastery and understanding of your art. Because never mind his performances and music videos, there are countless interviews on YouTube of people who have worked with Michael Jackson. And I've personally spoken with uh, a good friend of the director of one of his music videos. So I heard from firsthand what it was like working with Mr. Jackson in the room. It doesn't matter if they were sound technicians in the studio recording his albums, the, the, the dance team or choreographers working on his concert shows or the directors shooting the videos. They all consistently describe the most obsessed, perfectionist, driven personality they've ever seen. If he wasn't happy with it, he wanted another 100 takes. If he didn't like the look of that car, he didn't care what it costed, he would pay for it and he would get exactly what he wanted, no matter how insane it sounded. And this consistent behavior dates back to 1969, when he was 11 years old with his first number one hit with, his, with four of his brothers, the Jackson Five, at, at a time when he was doing the Ed Sullivan Show and in the charts the same time as the Beatles. Michael had the, the whole team of brothers on point in studio, on stage for photo shootings. He was the drill master. Um, okay, uh, another, uh, I'll, I'll name uh, just a few others. Bruce Lee, of course who um, a lot of people don't know because they were Asian and they were B movies and no one will ever get to see them. He had done 20 movies by the time he was age 20. Um, as a performer and as a television performer, David Copperfield, of course. And um, for, for a, a couple of decisions that he made wrong, I'll name one other person who I was a fan, am a fan of, Mr. Sean Connery, uh, the actor. And I'll have to Google the year, but I do remember about 12 or so years ago, 2006 or seven, watching his last movie on DVD called The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, terrible movie. It, 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 was, it, was not, it was not a good movie. But in those days, watching it on DVD at the end, you just had to click on extras and interviews. And I've, I've since found this on YouTube. This, this, this is something to make you, people think. Somebody asked, the reporter asked Mr. Sean Connery after producing his last film, then he retired after this movie, why did you decide to do the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? And he says in his own words, well, a few years ago, my agent handed me a script, uh, which I read. It, it was, I couldn't understand it. The movie was too, the story was too complicated. I said, if I can't understand it, not gonna play in it. So I said no and turned it down. They wanted me to play something called Morpheus in a thing called The Matrix. They made it without me, another two parts, called it the greatest movie trilogy of all time. After The Matrix, my agent hands me another script and says, Sean, you really, you should do this one. This one's gonna be big. So I read it, didn't like it. Some children's story I'd never heard of, too many characters, couldn't understand it, so I said no. They wanted me to play something called Gandalf the Wizard in the thing called The Lord of the Rings. They made it without me, another two parts called that the next greatest movie trilogy of all time. After that, my agent hands me another script. They have a vampire with the Invisible Man, with Jekyll and Hyde, with Dorian Gray, with a British hunter, and none of this makes sense, but I was afraid to say no. So just think in an alternate universe, what his career would have looked like if he'd ended you know, his last eight years on those two trilogies, those six movies. Two Matrix, uh, three Matrix movies and three Lord of the Rings. Didn't happen because, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, Mr. Connery wasn't paying attention to changes in trend. Yeah. But otherwise, he was the best James Bond. Sorry. He was the man as, as James Bond. <laughs> yes. No, 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 no offense to Daniel Craig, because um, I think he's the second best, but... But uh, Sean Connery is always going to be tops in my book. So, okay. Wow. You don't, do you sleep? Do you sleep? I do. Okay. Sometimes. <laughs> Every once in a while. Talk to me about your daily routine. What, what's that like? Um, well, currently I, I, I go to work, um, teach my lessons at the University of Mannheim, my, my courses, uh, also do the other 
English training lessons at uh, a company called BASF. So everyone in North America remembers they used to make the audio cassettes and the VHS videotapes. Um, they are uh, one of the largest companies in Germany and the world's largest chemical company. So I, I teach at one, one site that has 36,000 uh, um, people working there. So that's that's my my daily routine is walking into rooms. They can be smaller meeting rooms with a, a smaller group of people or larger classrooms with larger groups. And uh, I'm much I am much like Tyrion Lannister. I talk and I know things. Uh, so I basically get paid to do this what I'm doing now. Just share share ideas. Um, on top of that, if if I get uh, contacted for a performance as a magician or as a keynote speaker. Um, at a conference or event, then I, I just sort of disappear and make that happen. But I do have a pool of colleagues I can call on to, to cover and make sure that my uh, someone is, is covering my courses with my materials, my notes. And uh, parallel to that, for the next half year, I'll be working. Uh, <laughs> I'll be working with Little Johnny on the uh, the Karate Kid Two act, which is about what happens when. Um, when little Johnny's not so little anymore and he's standing next to me looks like a five foot 11 uh, uh, second version of me. And then we'll be performing this two man act together. And, and then I go to the dojo and we train karate together. Wow. It, again, I, I, you, you must sleep sometimes. Let me ask you one. And I have a, just a couple of more questions. What, is, what are you most curious about right now? What's what's got you revved? Is it is it the the Karate Kid two act with Johnny, or is there something else that you're really interested in pursuing? I'm really interested and excited by a lot of stuff. I really want to see. Uh, I've watched. Th I'm three episodes in, so I have three more episodes to go to the final season of Game of Thrones. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So if <laughs> no spoilers. Um, mm. Uh, yeah, I don't. So, I don't watch it, so I I will not be able to give you any spoilers. Okay, that excites me. Uh, Cobra Kai excites me. Um, sort of on a larger scope, how how humankind is now developing also excites me. You know, I, I I'm I'm in now. This is documented. I'm in like super crazy superhuman health, and I I know this for a fact. Uh, just two years ago now. I was one of 100,000 individuals living in Germany, uh, chosen at random by the German government to take part in a medical study where they don't pay the people anything, but it doesn't cost anything. We walk in and they do every known medical test known to man on us. And they test everything, including what's it called in English? This 3D uh, uh, whole body uh, MRI, MRI, mm -hmm. including an MRI. So all kinds of expensive, intensive thing just to see uh, d different people from different cities, different occupations, different age levels, what state of health we're in. And they repeat it every five years, as long as we're alive and agree to do it to see how we age. And uh, so I'm getting back concrete data that I just, uh, I've, I've been extremely blessed. And a part of this process was sitting in front of a computer for an hour, uh, going through like a 500 plus question questionnaire where they asked, do I work with fumes, chemicals, paints, all of which I answered no. You know, do, uh, heavy lifting, do I move boxes or tables, vibrating drills or equipment, no, loud noises, no, bright lights like, uh, like welding, no, um, uh, you know, corrosive chemicals, no, 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 um, harassment at work, no, uh, time pressure to get projects done by a certain time, no, I walk into this building, that classroom, deliver the Ryan show and walk out, under pressure from a boss to, to, to achieve a certain number of sales or performance or get projects done, no, none of it. The only thing that could impact my immortality from 500 plus questions was, do you sit for several hours a day in a chair? So since that study, I just now am doing a lot more stage style, wandering back and forth at the front of whatever room I'm in. So other than that, uh, I'm, I'm extremely blessed to be in a position where I love my work, love life, love myself, love the people around me, and I'm just aging incredibly, and I'm sure this, this will continue. Um, but the genetics, my parents and all my grandparents backs, backs this up. 
So back to your question. Sorry, that was an aside. I thought it was a, related to your question. Absolutely. What exactly, what exactly was the question again? What what excites <laughs> me now? Yeah, what's yeah. what's most inspiring to you right now? And you inspiring. said ah, lots of things are inspiring, so that's great. I want to see how how the zeitgeist, how how the the current today's in mode of think what's what's going to happen because we, we've reached a point in mainstream western society where facts free speech and opinion are automatically labeled hate speech everything has become polarized Every, everyone's an extremist no matter what opinion you have on an issue or, or what you say and and uh, we're just living in crazy times if you're 40, you, you remembered a, a day and age where if you mouthed off in front of your parents on the street, some other other random adult who your parents didn't even know, who you didn't know, would say, hey, young man, is that the way you speak to your mother? You know, I, I remember older men taking mouthy kids by the scruff of the neck, grabbing the back of their T-shirt and jacket and, you know, dragging them to their face and say, now, listen to me. That's not the way you speak to people. That would never happen in today's day and age. Kids tell their parents to F off. Kids have no respect for anything. You know, politeness, education, free speech, opinions, you know, <laughs> facts, uh, the government. I, I don't know. It's just we're living in, in weird times I never would have imagined. Um, so it's very interesting for me to see, uh, see what's going to happen. It's been reflected in, in so many ways in, in, in the European Union and in the States and Britain now where, where just decisions are being made by the people that make other parts of the society wonder, hang on, Brexit leaving the European Union or wondering, oh, hang on, who did, who did just got voted as president or wondering, hang on, what exactly is the European Union Parliament doing, you know? But then if you question it, suddenly you have some other party or some other side or some other neighbors saying, oh, you, you're not allowed to question things. You're not allowed to speak out a, about anything anymore. You know, feelings over facts. Ah, the, and you think that's where we are now is feelings over facts? We've, yeah, we've moved to a, to a place of feelings over facts and free speech. Hmm. So it sounds to me like you advocate a more rational approach. Is that correct? Would that be a fair assessment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that a principle for you? A guiding principle? Rationality? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I recently, I unintentionally, when I was in North America, and I apologize profusely for this, I recently triggered somebody not wanting to. I, I triggered somebody who I care about with with you now i've been living in in germany in europe for the last 20 years calm polite diplomatic discourse expression and exchange of ideas listening to to the other guy's point of view is part of the european mentality this is the way we speak once you're around smart people and i enjoy this very much and i very often discuss issues and ideas with very smart people and I'd forgotten this on a re last year's visit to North America. And what slipped out of my mouth when talking about one specific group of people in Europe, in a situation where I was dealing with a group of Europeans talking about another minority group, I, I, I put together the two words, you people. Not even directly. I was not talking to an African-American saying, now you people are are great at whatever. I was saying I, I could understand why a European, you know, after Germany accepts 1.5 million newcomers, many of which without papers or passports, and none of their whereabouts are being tracked, and all kinds of crazy stuff happening. I can understand why in a, this sort of situation a European might want to 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 say to them now, if you people and discussion ended there, because of course this trigger person said, whoa, bang right there ryan you're a racist and i can't listen to the rest of what you're saying I, I didn't even know what i said because i was probably translating logical clear thought in german into english and he said the very fact that you just said you people how racist is that and here's where the discussion begins i said tell me why that's racist 
and and they, they they parroted a very typical mainstream well because it's put up walls and you're judging another group of people just based on stereotypes it's us and them and you think this because of just the, the color of the skin or where they're from and i said no no not true and i'll tell you why i as a logical thinking human being will never be uh offended by the word combination you people when another person speaks to me what's interesting to me is what follows you people then i'll start listening if they're not getting in my face and screaming at me but politely just having a conversation mm -hmm. if they were to say to me for example ryan you people you think that you're the world's police you're setting up army bases where you just don't belong and i would i would say uh, one moment are you are you saying this because you believe i'm a, a u.s american citizen yeah aren't you your your accent you sound so american sorry i was born in canada my passport says i'm canadian that's where i grew up that's where i went to school and now i'm based in europe end of discussion why would i be offended by that some person doesn't like some of the military actions of the u.s government i'm not even a u.s american citizen done if, let's flip it the other way, someone were to say, Ryan, you people, you're a bunch of wusses. You're just, you're just cowering in the corner. You're like Switzerland. You don't do anything. You don't matter in the world. And I would say, what do you mean? Do you mean us Canadians when you say you people? Yeah, exactly. You're from Canada, aren't you? And I would say, I am from Canada. Yeah, well, you, you don't do anything. You're right. If what they say is factually right, how can I be offended by this? So I will never, ever be offended by anything anyone says to me with you people. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I apologized anyway, because I, a part of me remembered in that moment, you can't be in North America and talk about, you know, touchy issues and ever put those two words together, you people, because then <laughs> any North American is going to get triggered by that and then call and then call you a racist. How did that get resolved? That was all right, you know. I just got the person a handshake and a hug and then said, bro, man, listen, let's just, let's hang out and do something fun and just talk about something else because I did not mean what you thought you heard you said, you know. It's really, language can be difficult. And it's also, I think, difficult when you are living in a different in a different place from where you find yourself communicating. You know, you you're you spend your time, a lot of your time in Europe, and things are likely done a little differently than they are here in the USA or in Canada. Have you noticed that outside of this particular example that it's that it takes some getting used to? Oh yeah. Well, every situation, anywhere you go in the world, mm -hmm. you know, but you, you, you do a bit of research. Google where you want to go before you show up. If you don't like snow. Don't plan your trip in Alaska for too long and don't live there long term. You don't like Chinese people or rice, you know, shorten your visit to China or skip it. You know what, you know what I'm saying? Now, how, I, I think your Russian's good enough. Your Russian's fluent. I'll give you a, a concrete example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I was invited to go to a, a Russian club mm -hmm. by four Russian men. I think it was Pavel, uh, Yura, uh, Alexei, and... Uh, I believe. So four Russian guys that I, I'd been friendly with and hanging out with, they said, Ryan, come, you come with us. We show you a great club. And I know I'm sounding like Borat. Now, this, <laughs> was, a club, this was a club I'd never heard of because um, for those Russian listeners who hear this, they'll laugh and know, know about this. But for, for anyone else hearing this, in, in a Russian club in Germany, any woman who is young enough and attractive enough or wearing a short enough skirt to be eye candy is allowed in. You can be black, Arab, Chinese, what you want. They don't care. The men, Ukrainians and Russians only. If you're German or British or American or anything else that is non-Russian, they will not let you in the club. That's just their policy. You can't argue that. It's their club. They decide who gets in. And the guy standing at the door was this, the, the, was this monster. He looked like the boxer of Vladimir Klitschko, just this huge monster because the culture is completely different in a Russian club. When a man gets in your face or uh, says the wrong thing to your woman, bam, you know, the, the, the altercations start. They, they get hands on. And uh, so the, <laughs> the bouncer's not just there for looks. Now, I made the mistake. My Russian's not great, but I can understand, you know, enough to, to just to say, yeah, yeah, 
Well, it's a lot of show and I can sort of uh, participate. And the four guys walked into the club before me. They'd all been there before. They're all Russian. They look Russian because Russians have a certain facial structure and a square jaw and the cheekbones. And they're a little bit better built than the average guy because they all lift weights and do kickboxing. And there's a certain posture about them, which is very Eastern European. And they're speaking Russian. So you can see from a mile away, here's four Russian guys walking in the club. And then me, Asian guy, I'm coming up the rear, and the bouncer gets in my face and just yells something. He puts his hand on my chest and shoves me back and goes, Ugh! and yells something to be in Russian that I didn't understand, but it wasn't friendly. He says, yeah, and he gets in my face. Here's how I resolved it. I said, Ya Kazakh, Ya Gavriu Poruski. So let me translate to English for your viewers. So he got in my face and basically uh, shoved me back, hand on my chest and said, you're not coming in here. You're not getting in the club. And my answer to him was, uh, I'm a Kazakh. I'm, a, I'm from Kazakhstan, which Russian people will know are Asian looking people who speak Russian. Um, and that's the only reason he let me in the club. And he said, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, oh yeah, you know. When you're dealing with another culture, you, 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 will be doing, you will be doing yourself a favor if you have a certain amount of, of research and, and, uh, and uh, knowledge behind you. Sure. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. Always. I would add to that personally when I, when I talk with my students about this. Also, you got to build your perceptive skills. Your, yes. your, perceived, your abilities and perception have to be honed if you're in any situation. I think it's, I think it's a brilliant move to, to hone those skills. Let me ask you just a couple of other things because here we are. How can okay. people find you? What, what, what do they need to do to find Ryan Hayashi, either through the magic or through the dojo or people in Mannheim who want to know more about your, your uh, martial arts. Where, where are you online? How can people get a hold of you? I'm everywhere. Uh, I'm very easy. Ryan Hayashi is very easy to find. It's ryanhayashi.com. <laughs> Ta-da! Ta-da! I'm on Instagram, <laughs> YouTube, Facebook. Uh, I have my own YouTube channel, all of which are called Ryan Hayashi. Now, the only problem is spelling Hayashi because uh, nobody, nobody can spell it. The easiest way to find that is just Ryan, R-Y-A-N, and then just Google or search in YouTube under Ryan Samurai, because there's not a whole lot of samurai guys out there waving uh, uh, swords around and doing insane, insane stuff. Uh, and then automatically you get the Hayashi, H-A-Y-A-S-H-I. Everybody get down, let, you, let me see your hands high. Girl, <laughs> 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 step up, it's the last samurai. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So and you rap. I love it. The YouTube channel Ryan Hayashi, uh, the Facebook public figure Ryan Hayashi. Um, I've reached my five thousand limit, but the private person Ryan Hayashi is is also on on Facebook. So it's just my name, Ryan Hayashi, and I'm everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And I loved what you said to uh, Allison Hannigan. Wind me up and let me go. <laughs> <laughs> Wind me up and let me go. Yeah, yeah. that was um, great. You you were you were putting off a good bit of energy there. I could tell even just watching. It was uh, well, that what, was what the viewers never got to see. If you, if you don't mind me explaining this, no, 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 not at all. What, what you got to see in the broadcasted ten minute segment because they're they're dealing with a. It's only allowed to be so long. That was a fantastic piece of television. I laugh myself silly like a little comedian every time I watch myself in that segment because it was so honest and so raw. If I weren't me, I'd say, well, I, I am me and I still find it funny. But <laughs> here's the thing. The, this was my first time doing American television. Not my I had done uh, British television before, not my first time in English. No, it really it was because I had switched to a more, not quite British, but an almost neutral transatlantic overdone. So it was my first time American television in American English, which is my first language first accent without the persona because I tried to sell them on a more theatrical let me dress as a samurai they said no sword no samurai outfit no Asian music not even the storytelling thing of this karate kid we want a regular relatable guy showing up in western clothing saying here look what I can do I wrote the epic monologue around it um, but 
in the rehearsals, as I unleashed and went into this mode, the executive producers, they walked up to me and they said, this, there's this thing, you, this is in, insanity. There's this thing you do with your eyes and voice when you talk about um, the amount of mental energy I've invested in creating this act could demolish planets. It, 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 they said, could you sort of be that guy like even more? And I thought, oh, so, oh not, not only for that, whatever it is, 30 second monologue, like, can you just be, I said, all right, you asked for it. I'll, I'll be that. So then I unleashed on them. They said, after you're done your act, walk to the front center of the stage. Alison Hannigan will take over. She'll interview you for about five minutes, which is more than we need. We need like, what, 30 seconds. Talk to her. We'll cut it later. And I said, if I'm going to be this guy, which is really me, but I'm just going to lower my filters a bit, keep it clean for television, but just I'm going to hit people with truth bombs. I'm, I'm, I'm really going to be that guy. And they said, go for it. They gave me the green light. What happened, because I've been watching this series for four seasons already, and I know that the average magician did their best during magic performance time, came forward and just shut down and became very meek or too quiet. And Allison, being all bubbly with her big googly blue eyes, would say, wow, and uh, so you're from this country, and so you're the, you're the clown of magic. And so how did you come up with that storyline, and how do you think? And they would say, yeah. And they just didn't deliver. And I, for me, the, the show wasn't over until I walked off that stage. So what happened was I did my act. Crowd goes wild because I end on this one line that uh, there will always be an Asian who takes it to the next level. I'm Ryan Hayashi, the samurai man, man of magic. Show me some love. And I'm just filling the hall with, with, with this booming voice. And then I see Allison start to clap and walk toward front center stage. And I walked to front center stage and you saw, they showed just the beginning of how I commandeered the show. I just took over um, with everything, with my body language. And I, and I said, yeah, wind me up and let me go. I am a walking cloud of testosterone right now, Allison. I feel like zombie Bruce Lee on steroids. And I just kept talking. And then when I did stop, because she's a seasoned professional with, with the 20 plus years in television and she's a comedic super heavyweight. And then when I turned it and I said, do you want to ask me a question, Alice? And she said, no, I just want to watch you. I'm so impressed. And I said, um, boom, then I'm going to go on this. And I forget what lines I had, but I put on a 20 minute uh, um, stand up comedy show that the world <laughs> will never get to see, but which I will never forget because uh, uh, they gave me creative license to just be that. And they didn't kick me off the stage. At one point when I realized I'd been standing there for 10 minutes telling Allison what's what, but in a fun and friendly way and, uh, uh, you know, just drawing her in and making it to an interactive two-man show, but with me taking the lead, at one point I went like this. I stared into front center camera and I went, are we all right for time, Allison? Now, of course, they cut this out, but she she did something. She like looked over at some signal guy and said, she said, they're telling you to keep going. All right. So what I'm going to tell you now, and it just, the show did not end. It was it was insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. That I'm sorry that it's not going to see the light of day. Hopefully you got that B-roll. No, 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 oh, no, no one shame. will ever see that. But it, it, was, it was a very funny moment. And uh, I was just essentially telling jokes. Yeah. Well, well, telling jokes on steroids, it sounds like. <laughs> 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 I love it. So, Ryan, are there any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Any last things that you want to leave this episode with? Last thoughts for your listeners. Um, yeah, Un unleash the warrior within and it doesn't have to be a warrior. It's, it's just the you that you know you are. Maybe it's the you that you want to be. And it depends on each person. E each person wants to do, have, or be something. Just know what that is. And then here's, here's the thing. I'm not really, um, <clears throat> an esoteric sort of, um, manifestation the law of attraction is enough that you dream it and you'll have it the next day i'm just a really practical guy that says put in the work you want a better voice find a voice coach you want to be a better presenter get a speaking coach 
You know, you want a little bit less get gut or a little more six pack, get a coach, which you only really need for two or three workouts and just keep showing up at the gym a lot for more than two weeks, make it two years and then see how far you're, you're going. That, that, that's all it is. So just, um, um, you know, I just wish all your listeners the best decide for yourselves, your own path. We're living in a crazy messed up world. A lot of you are missing uh, enough trust and belief in yourselves to be confident people. Um, I don't know why I'm still trying to figure that out, looking at current human society and the state of affairs, but it doesn't matter. Um, in this life between uh, baby and, uh, you know, old, dead or incapacitated, we were only given a certain amount of time. And again and again, uh, everyone tells us that the, the, the people who talk to enough older folk later in life, they, they, older folk never regret what they've done, good or bad. They regret what they, what they haven't done in life. And life flies by so fast. So I say just, you know, um, you know, hold down a job, be responsible, pay for your bills and your kids. And other than that, if whatever desire and, and, and energy and, and lust for life is left, uh, do something for it with it that, that, that floats your boat. Doesn't matter what it is, playing golf, flower arranging. For me, it was just being a magician for a while. Yeah, and sage advice. I like it. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to impart a lot of really, I mean, you dropped a bunch of wisdom, which I think is great. And I'm very excited for everyone to hear about the way you're looking at the world. It's fascinating. And, um, it, and there's, and there's no BS, you know, <laughs> I really, I'm so grateful for that. You're, yeah, I, that's very, to me, it's inspiring just the idea of having, um, uh, a person like you out there who you're, you decided what you were going to live like, and now you're doing it. And that's wonderful. So go you and keep on doing it. Go I want... you, is <laughs> you are a very nice person. Spasiba Valshoya, Spasiba Valshoya. Oh, well, this is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I'm here with the amazing Ryan Hayashi. I'm so grateful that you joined the episode today, Ryan, and, and I'm so grateful to all of you who are listening. Please remember to rate and review the podcast, subscribe to get more such incredible interviews. Get in touch with Ryan Hayashi if you want to know more about what he's doing. As he said, he's an incredible, uh, well, he's an incredible sensei, I can tell already, but he's also available for uh, keynote speeches and he travels because I know that you just went, Ryan, recently. So please get in touch with him if you have events that you would like to see the Ryan Hayashi Samurai or the Karate Kid 2 act at. And if you want to learn more about presentation and public speaking and having confidence. And in fact, you now know what confidence is, which is great. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm really grateful you were here. Thanks very much. Sending you all of my love. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new and please tell your friends about the community we're building here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright Isolde Trachtenberg 2019. Today's music was from Kevin McLeod, Laser Groove, and Avi Marimba, brought to you by Creative Commons License 3.0. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, I send you all all of my love.